welcome people. Um, so I work with uh, Red Hat and I specialise in the platform as a service a solution area for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, for those of you that don't know about Red Hat, basically we do two things, right? So we're the open source company. Uh, a key thing we do is, is contribute, support and drive activity in the open source community. And on the flip side, we are then involved in taking that and productizing that and turning it into products that enterprises can use. Okay, so they can trust open source software. So the net of all that is hopefully we create demand for people to work really interesting projects on open source software. So that's what we're, what we're trying to achieve. So I'll be talking tonight about um, OpenShift, the platform as a service, and how that's relevant in the microservices space to help you build some great applications. Uh, and a similar to I did a similar session like this in the Sydney Microservices Meetup a couple of months ago, and um, seem to have a pretty good response. And we've got a demo as well, but it's not just slides. Okay, so just to set some context in terms of, so you know, why are we here? I love, I love Matt Malcolm's quote about you know, agility and disruption and innovation. But ultimately, what we're trying to do, the problem we're trying to solve with OpenShift and with microservices is to make it you know, easy and enjoyable to build great systems, right, that can really make a difference, right? In the context of the sort of systems that enterprises are willing to pay for and fund and create jobs. Okay? So that's what we're trying to do with OpenShift in an environment around microservices. And then the sort of microservices and platform as a, uh, platform as a service context, it's all about sort of facilitating the capacity for small teams with different skill sets to get together that contribute in different ways to collaborate and deliver software so they don't sort of fall out of each other in the process. And I think what you'll see tonight is sort of how we go about achieving that with the technology, the role that technology has to play. So it's your patriotic duty, right, in terms of um, uh, platform service and containers. Okay, so why am I here? So I went through this in the, in the Sydney event and sort of this was sort of what I learned in the process and the sort of argument I have to make tonight in terms of justifying the connection between these different concepts, right? So first of all, microservices are good, right? Well, we're just, I'll, I'll, I'll let that ride, okay? That's an established fact, okay? So that takes sort of one beer and you've already had that beer. <laughs> the second beer you need is containers are good for microservices. So I hope you're going to sort of accept that particular proposition. And so we're getting closer. We're now at the two beer level, right? Third beer, PAS is good for containers. So that's definitely going to take three beers, right? So I'm going to focus, <laughs> I'll be focusing a little bit tonight around this sort of particular area and establish the connection between why you need PAS to manage container environments at scale to solve important problems, okay? The next proposition is definitely four beers now, right? OpenShift is a good pass, okay? So obviously I'm going to talk about how OpenShift approaches the problem of providing a pass capability. So the whole notion of platform as a service, I mean there's no really ex one accepted defined definition here, so ultimately it's what vendors like us take to market and present as, as a sort of level of abstraction and the kinds of services you need to make it easy to build applications around containers that may be, obviously, um, then implementing the microservices that you need for your application. Okay, another beer. OpenShift is therefore good for microservices, all right? So that's the five beers that it will take to accept what I'm saying tonight, and hopefully by the end of it you'll get there. So we need a whole six pack, because at the end of the day, why are we here? Need us a social, right? So, what, what, certainly one thing, one thing we're trying to achieve here is you can talk to me afterwards in Q&A as well and we can sort of go deeper in some of these areas. So that's the basic premise for tonight. That's the proposition we're going to go through and hopefully um, you know, drink responsibly, right, when you get to that particular point. Okay, so that's the proposition we're going to get to tonight, which is you know, OpenShift, platform as a service, provides a great platform for hosting containers, which is a great medium for building and deploying microservices. Okay, so the, um, the, the premise around the platform as a service con concept is pivoted around the notion of containers. I'll just check, so who's familiar with sort of the notion of containers and the Docker container specification format? Okay, good, good, right. Well, I won't spend too much time here, right? So the idea with containers is that it provides this sort of isolation and resolving all the dependencies around this single deployable unit, which is a fantastic breakthrough because that means it's really easy to package up and then deploy in different locations. It makes it for a very portable way of packaging up applications. And ultimately, in a microservices context, when you're really trying to build important applications, this facilitates the ability to, uh, if you like, isolate away, isolate away your particular microservices so they don't get confounded with the work that other people are doing. 
So when you're trying to work as teams, that's a really important concept. So we've got this idea of resolving all the dependencies that provides in a sort of deployable unit, which is then portable across different host systems. So with Red Hat, that means, of course, that you can deploy on Red Hat Enterprise Linux that can be deployed in different form factors. On the laptop, on the middleware, on the cloud, on the internet, on, or in some sort of hybrid arrangement. With the, um, the container, that pretty much provides a way of isolating that particular workload. So here you've got the basis of a nice way of packaging up a microservice that is isolated, will guarantee that it runs in some particular isolated secure environment and it won't meddle with other workloads that are being shared on the same host, host environment. So that's the sort of part of the contract established around the container. And then there's an interesting property course around containers and on the Docker specification format, and there's a notion of immutability, right? So that uh, you draw down an image, and that becomes a runnable instance as a container, and you can't tamper with it, uh, which makes a great way for having a portable model for pushing code through your particular application lifecycle management without a chance of it being tampered and broken. So that's the basic model we're working with. And what we've done with OpenShift version 3 is that we've moved the container, the supported container specification format to Docker. Okay, so OpenShift version 3 then provides a native support for the Docker container specification format. There are some really interesting properties around containers that some people may not be immediately aware of, which is really important for our large enterprise customers. Because ultimately, sort of the market that we're addressing in terms of this whole problem space is to encourage large enterprises with big budgets that are trying to build big, important systems to adopt this sort of technology, which then obviously creates work for you. So one of the things you can do around this particular container model, one of the corollaries of its application is that, for example, you can have a particular application, it could be from an IC, it could be your own, which you've certified and done all your regression testing on some particular version of Linux, say, say RHEL version 6. Okay? So you can package that up as an image based on Docker and then run that as a container, host it on an operating system that might be, say, at a different level, like Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux version, version 7. So this is a big issue for enterprises because there's a lot of cost involved with standard operating environments. Okay? So anything you can do to ease the cost of actually being able to host and manage different applications and different versions on a, on a different operating system means big savings for organisations. So there's some really interesting benefits around this container model. And when you talk to a large bank like Commonwealth Bank of Australia, you know, migrating from one version of an operating system to another is an enormous volume of data exercise. And this means also for suppliers and ISPs that build systems, it means they only need to regression test against the version of Docker and then, as long as that version of Docker is supported, they don't have to retest or re-regression test on a different version of the operating system. Big deal. That really takes it up to the next level in terms of making it easier to work with microservices built around the container model. These things make a big difference for enterprises in terms of them being able to trust this sort of model, uh, this sort of technology to build sort of important systems. So um, there was only a couple of beers to get to this point, right? Most of which you've already drunk in previous sessions, which is around that uh, we like microservices and you know, there's a nice fit between the container model and, and hosting, hosting microservices. But now we need a few, now we need to get into the third beer, right? Which is, is that enough? No, it's not. So in order to sort of take that particular model in terms of building microservices and deploying them as, as portable units around the sort of container model, there's a number of other issues that we need to address that would concern an enterprise in terms of able to build and host significant systems at scale. So these, some of these sort of quality of service issues that need to be resolved that aren't immediately addressed by agreeing on even on the, on the container specification are things such as you know, quality of service. Okay? The whole orchestration and life, life cycle and high availability around, around these containers that are running in your environment. Creating them, deleting them, scaling them up, scaling them back. Uh, access to you know uh, persistent storage, external volumes, etc. So the quality of service parameters we need to deal with. Uh, obviously security. Okay, so that's just paramount. If you're trying to convince a major organisation to move to this sort of particular technology, they've got to trust 
the model. They've got to be able to trust that what's being deployed in production uh, is safe, is, has, has some manageability strategy around dealing with security incidents. Another big one is around communication or inter-container communication. So people quickly find the sort of day two issues around the container model is that when you start to build large distributed systems, uh, your application ultimately is going to consist of microservices intercommunicating, right, As, you know, between containers. But where are these containers? What is the addressing endpoint of these particular containers, right? These containers at runtime, they're ephemeral sort of things, right? They're being you know, created and destroyed all, all the time, right? So they're moving about your infrastructure where they're being hosted as a workload at the operating system level. So there's an issue in terms of um, how do you deal with exposing a reliable addressable endpoint so that containers can intercommunicate. And again, this is not something that's immediately addressed by the standard Docker specification or just looking at containers themselves. This is something that needs to be addressed by the system that is hosting the, these workloads at scale. So these are sort of all, all, all sort of scale issues that you don't find with, um, you know, when you're just working with containers on your desktop or your laptop building a small scale system. But when you get to starting to deploy them at large scale, these issues start to hurt you. And that then gets into areas things like manageability, right, which is we've now potentially got tens of thousands, millions, Google's case billions of Workloads as containers, they need to be managed, they need to be tracked, they need to be somehow scheduled and, and properly, or, properly organised around the particular infrastructure. And then a, 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 again, there are other sort of issues that need to be addressed for people to be able to effectively work together to build applications of significance based on containers. So you need some agreement around how we're going to team together, how we integrate with continuous integration, and continuous delivery pipelines standards that we're going to use. Okay. So these are notionally sort of a bunch of issues that need to be addressed to take this sort of basic unit around a container to make it manageable at large scale. And that's of course where we start to get to in terms of a platform as a service and the sorts of issues and capabilities it needs to address. <clears throat> so just to amplify one of these sort of points is say for example uh, let's say I want to grab and pull down an image to run a container for MongoDB, right? If I was to do that, if I go to the public internet, of course, or even go to the uh, Docker Hub, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different MongoDB images. Which one do I use? What, which one can I trust? What's in these particular images? These are things that are obviously going to be important to the enterprise. We're going to be, be able to trust these particular um, sources of technology. So Red Hat's role in this particular area is, of course, to provide some kind of certified, trustworthy distribution around these images based on this Docker certification. So back to the very first thing, right? What does Red Hat do? You know, we're a catalyst in the open source community. We make some big bets and investments on particular important open source projects, such as, such as Docker, for example. And then we have a commercial model then around encouraging the adoption and use of this technology by large-scale enterprises to build important systems. So one of the things they look for, of course, is some way of having secure distributions that they can trust and that are supported around these images. So you've got then your PHP image, which would distribute. If there's an incident around PHP, for a security incident around PHP, of course, we'll distribute, distribute that, fix it, and make it available. So that's core in terms of the value proposition around the sort of hurdle that uh, senior executives in IT, large scale IT organisations think about in order to actually take this next step. Okay, so that is a key one around this sort of trust issue. And you've got to cross that barrier if you're talking to you know, large telcos, large banks, you know, large insurers, that's what they want to know. <clears throat> so when you pull all this together, in terms of what does what are we doing with platform as a service and openship, it's, so, it's fairly straightforward. So what we want to be able to do is to make it easy and quick, so developer productivity around building container-based applications that are, of course, safe and scalable that you can trust, so that IT or, so ops is actually willing to deploy what dev is up to. Okay. Then a key part of the sort of whole sort of DevOps approach, agile approach to, to uh, build a systems is that that's then presented in a manner that is fundamentally self-service for developers. So they've got autonomy and control in terms of what they do. 
and for operations, it's then provides automation around how those particular workloads are managed. So this is fundamental to sort of providing a sort of agile environment that will encourage developers to use containers managed under a platform that is secure, rather than going rogue, which is obviously the alternative that we have to deal with. And so we're trying to provide all that while balancing sort of the competing design tensions, right? Operations wants control, developers want the latest and greatest, right? So these are the sorts of things that we balance in terms of these capabilities. So that in a nutshell is what we're trying to do around platform as a service, okay? And when you get these things right, it means dev will build systems on platforms that are properly supported by operations to build systems that will actually get deployed. <clears throat> so when you bring all that together in terms of the sort of features and attributes that we look for in a platform as a service that we try and deliver around uh, OpenShift as a platform as a service. So there's a number of attributes that we need to bring so that at the end of the day, you can build container-based applications that are meaningful, right, not just tools, yeah? Uh, fundamentally, develop a sort of service, the capability around automation, the ability to do that at large scale, uh, the orchestration, and the ability to collaborate so that it's easy for people to work together <coughs> tying this whole life cycle around your approach to continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, so it makes it possible to socialise and work together. And I'll show you how we actually do that. The projects that are based around OpenShift, the open source uh, uh, project, uh, as I mentioned hopefully in the blue that you read before we turned up, is that um, OpenShift Origin is the up, what we call the upstream community project that, from which OpenShift is derived. Okay? So that, that's, anyone can check that out, download it, not, uh, and, and, and use it. It's, at the end of the day, an aggregation of a number of important other open source projects that, that are pulled together into a product to provide a usable one. Um, and the key ones, of course, I've talked a little bit about Docker, the container specification. Another one is Kubernetes, which is, provides the orchestration capability. So that's how we manage the life cycle of creating and destroying very large numbers of containers based on Docker images. And then there's sort of a number of other projects. But ultimately, these are the two key ones. An agreement on the, on the container spec and a particular approach to orchestration. So Kubernetes originates from work from Google and then Red Hat came on board and took that particular work, work that we're doing and then, if you like, productized it or organized it into an open source project called Kubernetes. That then becomes OpenShift Origin and that forks off into two variants. One is known as OpenShift Enterprise and that's a supported product that provides a platform as a service that you can deploy anywhere. Right? You can control where that's deployed. And that's one we typically talking about. There's another variant which is called OpenShift Online, which is our own cloud service capability that offers a platform as a service on the public cloud that you can consume. So this is actually available in, in, a, in, a, free, in a free form, or there's a, obviously expanded capabilities that are paid for. So um, you can actually go online and check out OpenShift from this particular, uh, from a particular website. So we do that in sort of two ways. But this, at the end of the day, is a supported product that enterprises then deploy to provide this sort of platform. So in examples of sort of an example of sort of company that is using OpenShift 3 and the model around Docker container based the Docker container based certification and also um, specification and also Kubernetes for orchestration based on OpenShift is, is like Amadeus. Amadeus, Monster Online, you know, booking company you know, all the sort of suppliers in the travel industry space are sort of intercommunicating with them. They've got problems at massive scale, or opportunities at massive scale, I should say, uh, with very complex transactions that they have to manage, right, in terms of orchestrating, you know, potentially tightly coupled, you know, travel booking events. So they're moving their next generation platform onto this particular container, container-based model, but in, at enormous scale. And if you're into this stuff, you know, Google it and you'll have you get some detail on that. But ultimately, some of the capabilities that they, they looked for, which, which they're getting from this particular approach, is you know, a consistent, homogenous approach to how to build applications, right from the developer's experience on his workstation 
through to unit testing, through integration testing, through production. When you're building on this approach around these immutable containers, you're building for the it, it, it's a consistent image all the way through the deployment, right? So you don't run into that major problem whereby your application changes as you transport it to different environments and you're, and you're rebuilding it. So some interesting things they're really do, um, doing that particular way. And again, they're getting into hundreds of thousands of core processing units in terms of what they're doing around this sort of platform. Okay, I mentioned about OpenShift Online. That's the public cloud service we provide. Very large scale site, millions and millions of applications, hundreds of thousands of users on there. So that provides our our, mo our sort of marketing test bed to find out what users are really after from the, from the, from the case. The OpenShift Online service today is on version two, not version three. So it's not based on the Docker container format or the Kubernetes orchestration model, but it will be. So um, sometime next year, it will flip over to version three as well. So when you sort of layer this all together, basically what we're doing with a platform is to productize the ability to be able to host large scale, large numbers of containers based on Docker in a way that's sort of manageable and easy to operate with from a developer point of view and from an operations point of view. And so there's obviously a number of capabilities that we put together in terms of packaging that up. But ultimately what we're trying to achieve as a product is that if we didn't do this, you could always just take those disparate open source projects and try and stitch it up together and do it yourself, right? That is an option, but you'll quickly find, if you go that way, there's a significant investment you need to make in terms of getting across that technology to get value out of it. And for large enterprises, that's not a problem they want to deal with, right? So they can support a product to help them achieve that. Then, with, in terms of the actual uh, sort of uh, sources of technology stacks that you can then use for building these applications. Again, um, we pr provide certified registry or source of you know, all your favorite open source technology stacks, which we will then take care of supporting and dealing with and patching security incidents. You can also, of course, then source images from the public or from the internet, right, and from the Docker Hub or from other private or external uh, uh, registries. So these then become, you know, vast numbers of potential sources of technology that you may then assemble to build your particular application. And obviously one of the value around agreement on a container specification like Docker is that we've now got a standard to actually encourage that. So that's the key to sort of the proliferation of um, this sort of approach to development. All right, so under the hood. Okay. So I'll go through a couple of slides to explain actually how this works, and that might, for some people that might be a good way to sort of get across it. What I'll do is I'll build up this particular slide, and I'll explain the sort of different components and what they're actually achieving. And that will give you also a good sense in terms of what the orchestration's about, what the containers are about. But just to sort of, you know, as a snapshot, right, at the end of the day, this is a cloud scale-up platform to host Container-based workloads, so ultimately these workloads are living in operating system host instances, which you then scale out or scale back based on demand. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> where does this thing run? So with the platform as a service, the way we approach it, it's basically you can run it anywhere. So anywhere you can run a, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux operating system, you can deploy the platform. What that means is you can deploy it private, on-premise, off-prem, you know, off-prem, Hybrid cloud, public cloud, private cloud, whatever. So there's no constraint in terms of where you, where you actually deploy it. And that's what organizations do. They typically actually look at a model whereby they have a combination of on-premise and off-premise public sort of uh, deployments. Then the workloads, the applications live on nodes, which are instances of the operating system, of course, based on, um, based, based on Linux. So these could be Virtual machines from VMware, it could be an Amazon managed instance, it could be bare metal, it doesn't matter, right? As long as they provide a host operating system environment. And then the uh, application services then run in containers on these particular nodes, okay? So multi tenanted across, across the farm of operating system instances. And we'll take care of via isolation to guarantee that there isn't obviously any confounding in terms of the namespace and the isolation. Security context within each of 
these um, containers. The way the, um, the deployable units are organised in, in a Kubernetes approach is they're known as pods. And pods provide you a way of aggregating a number of containers together, which could be one or more than one. Okay? Typically one, but you can also have you know, a sidecar sort of pattern as well. So what that means is that um, ultimately what your application looks like from a pod point of view is you've got your Docker image, at runtime that's pulled down, it becomes a container which is then wrapped up as a pod, as a deployable unit onto the platform. And it's at the pod level where you can then describe quality of service parameters around how this guy should operate. How many replicas do I have? What resources can I use, etc., etc. So the pod becomes a basic kind of deploying global construct uh, in this particular model. The images that you pull down to then run as containers at runtime uh, are sourced from registries, right? Which is a Docker compliant registry, right? So obviously we provide a registry and that's where all the different technologies are. Ruby, PHP, Java, etc, etc. Then the um, there's a sort of version of a command and control structure, which is called a master, which then manages the cluster, which is what this sort of arrangement is called. And the master becomes is the kind of control center that's providing a number of services that are necessary to manage this kind of system, uh, such as obviously authentication in terms of who can access what, um, storing the state of the system, what applications have I built, where are they? A scheduler, which is how we make um, how we make decisions about where pods are placed across this particular environment. And so, and what's interesting is that pod placement is can be based on a defined policy. So um, these nodes, which represent your infrastructure assets, which are running hosting these workloads, they can be labelled and organised in different ways. So they could be labelled to represent logical constructs such as dev, test, production, whatever you like. And that labelling can then drive the policy in terms of where, where different workloads are placed. Um, and then um, there's a notion of a service layer, and this is how uh, uh, pods can intercommunicate. So pods expose an endpoint via a service layer, and service layer is handled by the platform, and this solves the big problem around Intercontainer inter communication, where you've got these ephemeral workloads that could be, you know, popping and just being destroyed all over the place. Okay, because these are potentially ephemeral uh, workloads. So the service layer then exposes an endpoint, and the platform will then guarantee that this particular pod exposes an endpoint, a certain endpoint. And remember, this guy could be anywhere. Okay, so this uses the magic of software-defined networking to provide a sort of dynamic way of handling. But it's all completely transparent to users of the system. It's just provided as a service. And then there's a, the replication service. And what the replication service does is it's responsible for um, creating or potentially cloning replicas of the uh, application across the environment. So if you want HA, for example, you may want to clone you know, a number of these uh, pods on different nodes. And so, for example, if a pod goes down, then the replica uh, managed, replication manager is responsible for then cloning that pod on a different location. Yeah? So it's doing the sort of things like that all the time. And so, for example, well, like this originated from some of what Google did, right? And the Google, I and mean, they're working with you know, six billion containers a week, right? So they've, got to, they've learned a lot about problems around replication and scheduling. Another important service that we, that we offer for you know, building serious applications, of course, is uh, providing access to persistent storage. Right. So another thing that the platform needs to do is provide a way of exposing external volume mounts to containers like pods, so that they can then store state. So that's then again a service provided by the platform. So this <clears throat> this is really important, right? Because that really opens up the uh, the, the potential or, or Variance in terms of the sorts of different design patterns you can, and problems you can solve in this sort of um, container-based model, which is not necessarily available in other forms. And then another service that's provided is a routing layer, and the routing layer is how we expose 
uh, an addri you know, addressable endpoint to external consumers, right? So that if your clients want to sort of, you know, provide you know, request response through to these different applications, it's then managed through a routing layer, including providing capabilities such as HA load balancing or HA proxy. So that's how, what that means at the end of the day is that um, you make decisions about whether the application is exposed to the outside world and it will also take, automatically take care of them, providing the, um, the proxy mechanism to actually then fan out requests across multiple instances. So all that stuff around HA scaling, HA proxying, NGINX, whatever you're using, is all taken care of automatically by the platform. You just build your app. And they all become quality of service characteristics that are satisfied by the platform. So all that's stripped away. And then in terms of um, accessing the uh, platform, obviously, you know, we've got to satisfy needs around developers and operations. So that's where, obviously, here, we're responsible for exposing sort of different um, integration points and tools for using the system, such as, um, uh, you know, command line instructions, APIs, web consoles, and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, what's typically going on is um, you want to integrate your CI/CD plumbing so that it can then deploy it to the platform, and I'll show you how we go about doing that. So all those sort of tools are there, ultimately, you can go right down the API level and script it and do that sort of fun stuff. That's the platform, that's the system conceptually. This notion of pods and quality of service and persistent storage and registries. Ultimately, it means that you can build a container-based application and the whole quality of service and runtime performance is handled for by the system and you can step away. Now, how do you build these containers, right? There are different approaches that you can take, and one of them being straight native Docker images. Okay. So this is a native Docker container specification platform. So if you can get it as a Docker container, we can run it. Okay. So if you want to work with Docker, author a Docker file, build it, uh, create an image, you can deploy it that way. So that's sort of one way. So this is a, this is a model that would appeal to people that are, I guess, familiar with Docker and comfortable in operating at that particular level. But there are other models as well. <coughs> and another model, which is actually the primary way people would interoperate with the platform, is that you don't need to know about Docker. You don't even need to understand the notion around containers. You just work with what you're custom, comfortable with, which is typically uh, your content or source code that lives in some sort of git repository, okay, wherever that may be. And the way we approach it is basically like this. Um, point to your Git repo, uh, choose the image to build against a particular source code, and then we'll take care of building the container for you and deploying it. So you never actually need to understand anything about Docker. And there's some other advantages with that as well. Once you've done all that, basically, you're just working with PHP or whatever, right? Ruby, etc., and we'll then turn that into uh, an image in the registry which we can then deploy. Now, when we get to deployment, there's some interesting things we can do about that because um, we can have strategies around how your application is deployed, and one of those strategies might be a rolling update. So, whenever there's a change to the application via a change in the source code, a commit and push, you can define a strategy that says apply a rolling update. And we'll, that, then the platform will automatically take care of refreshing all those instances with the new version. Okay? Um, and the way that magic happens is basically by integrating and triggering via a webhook from your, you know, your, git, your git stash. <clears throat> so the uh, advantages of that are one of the key sort of benefits around sort of taking this document <coughs> model to the next level is that let's say is a security incident, right? I've got 1,000 PHP applications that my developers have gone rogue with and deployed out there in the wilderness, right? There's a PHP incident, there's a security alert, there's a patch that needs to be remedied. If it's a certified image, then that change will, will obviously will support that change, fix the patch, issue a new image. That image change is then detected automatically, and that will then automatically trigger a rolling update. So that, therefore, if you want to, you can 
choose deployment strategies that will then automatically take care of pushing through updates to reflect incidents such as you know, a patch for a security incident automatically. <coughs> so this, um, this is called source to image in terms of a build strategy. So there's two advantages of it, right? So one is, one I've mentioned, it makes it easier, you don't need to know about Docker. But the real advantage is that this way, operations can control and manage what images are used and when they're refreshed based on security and patching incidents. This is a big deal, right, if you're in a large enterprise and there's thousands and thousands of applications of different workloads with different technologies that you need to look worry about. So, a big deal. Um, so, examples like in the real world, a project we did, I did uh, involved last week, this particular client was using Stash from Atlassian and we just sort of build a kind of steel thread to demonstrate the integration, and it kind of works like this. Developers work in the stash, it's got a source code there. We create an application pointing to that particular Git repo. That can also be automated. Once that's done, that triggers building a Docker image and uh, triggers in a deployment as a container at runtime. So that's your kind of first start event. We'll then publish a webhook, which you inject in here, so that when, you're now, when you now go through your cycle of iterations, changing, changing code, committing, pushing it, that will then automatically trigger rebuilding the container, redeploying it. So it's completely transparent. So this is a sort of typical model that people, customers then do in terms of you know, separating north and south between the approach to CICD and then deployment as containers based on platform as a service from uh, So the magic happens by uh, you know, exposure of a web hook, which plugs in here. And will trigger the build. So um, this all then happens automatically, we don't have to worry about it. So big savings here in development and testing, right? So the traditional way people would be doing testing here would, would probably be, well, they, <laughs> commonly is, they would then drive some kind of puppet script that would build an entire app and <laughs> test it, tear it all down. Right? So in this particular model, instead of doing that, what you can do is just build the container and multi-tenant that container on existing infrastructure that reduces costs, makes it quicker and easier. Because a container, remember, is a lot more lightweight than building an entire host operating system and building all the code for it. Do a mobile application, whatever, right? So yeah, so for example, WordPress is an example. So you can pick an instant app, select the template, builds WordPress, and that will then deploy the order WordPress application, PHP server, integrated, MySQL, <coughs> uh, and then deploy as a, as a running instance. But more importantly, the template or recipe will also take care of binding up the credentials between you know, the, the database back to the client right, and all that kind of stuff. So that's another sort of thing we do. And it does all the magic in terms of um, uh, setting up the right URLs and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, so the different sort of ways. So, so in the real world, people um, typically be with the CICD tool and they'll be harvesting out some key templates that represent the recipes for how they build applications and that makes it really easy to start to compose lots and lots of applications really, really quickly. Yeah, so that, um, that's a sort of overview in terms of the, um, the product and then in terms of the uh, getting engaged, working with sort of platform, finding out more. So some of the things we've done here is that there's a notion of membership commons and that's open to organisations, but there's lots and lots of organisations, I think there's like 150 now, you know, Telstra and Singleview and a whole bunch of the Australian companies are already there, and they're sort of on the board supporting and, and contributing to the development of the platform, as well of course as a community, right? So everything's from the community, and if you want to sort of explore this for yourself, we try and make it as easy as possible, so OpenShift, the upstream community project is known as OpenShift Origin, so that's free community software, right? You can just go and grab it. If you go and Google around, you can pull, you can build yourself a, a vagrant image of it, and then you can sort of run an entire platform instance as a single vagrant image on your particular workstation, and then, was, then you can start to actually uh, you know, experience or try, try out some of the different capabilities. Uh, everything else, of course, is transparent and public, right? Uh, documentation and all that kind of stuff. But that's probably, if you're, if you're hands on, that's probably the simplest way to um, uh, approach it. Okay, demo. <laughs> now, everything collapses. <laughs>
So we'll pay uh, respects to the demo gods and then see what happens here. So what I've got is, um, I'll do an example of that um, source to image. So let's say I want to build a Node.js application. And that particular Node.js application just lives in, in a Git repository, right? And so on that repo, there's nothing to do with Docker or OpenShift or Red Hat or anything, right? It's just, um, it's just Node.js related code. Click Next. And then I'm just going to assign the, the Docker image that I want to build against this particular source code. So in this particular case, I'll, I'll pick, no, pick Node.js. And then what, I, what, that, what basically what I've done now, right, is I'm a developer, I just know Node.js, knock yourself out. Uh, I want to now run that as a container. I just pick the image I want to use, and then we'll take care of then creating that particular, turning the Docker image into a running container on OpenShift. So that's going to go ahead and, and do all that in the background. And um, at some stage, we'll just see how we go. These things all live as pods, right? In terms of OpenShift. And everything in OpenShift runs into a pod. Eventually, we'll, we'll, we'll get a builder pod for this, but I'll, I'll return to that in a minute. Okay. So, with, um, I'm now logged in as the sort of the owner of this particular system. So, if I look here, for example, here are some of the system level pods that are running on the system now. There's a pod there that's handling the registry, uh, there's a pod here that's handling route, you know, routing for the system itself. Um, and some other ancillary services. So everything organised around the platform is itself sort of managed and, and has containers and deployed, it, deployed into pods. <laughs> the system itself, the workloads live in nodes, right? And um, in this particular vagrant image, it's just a single instance and we've just got one particular node. So we've got one instance that's, that's both a, a master and a node, right, hosting workloads. And in a larger scale system, what you'll see is that there might be many, many nodes here, which then can be labelled. So I've actually got another one. So I've got one on, on the internet. Oh, of course so. Okay. So here, for example, is another system that's on, on the internet that I spun up. And it's got um, four nodes with different particular labels. Okay. This is a labelling strategy that can then drive scheduling. So decisions about where you schedule workloads can be driven, data driven by what, what zone do I want to deploy to, what region do I want to deploy to. So if you want to do something like anti-affinity, in other words, you want to make sure that a scale app doesn't get deposited in the same rack, <laughs> you would then just label your infrastructure and then specify an anti-affinity label so that it will make sure that it spreads across di different availability zones. Okay. So back in here. Okay, so now what's happening is that um, the um, that application that I built from the console, uh, there's a pod that's been launched to, to build it. Actually, the, so the build pod's already finished and it's now actually running. Okay. So if I want to look at the logs, so there's tailing the logs of that particular running application. So no big deal. Actually, it is a big deal because um, what this means is that the way I inspect logs for any technology, of any container, of any workload throughout the entire system is done consistently, right? So what people then do in the real world, of course, is that they then integrate that to provide for log aggregation via, you know, Splunk, Sumologic, or your, your favourite particular tool, right? So one thing that we achieve around the sort of platform as a service is that all technologies are tr treated in a, in a homogenous, uniform manner, all right? Whether it's Ruby, PHP, Java, Node.js, etc., they are all managed in a uniform manner. And the way that you integrate them for management purposes is all done in a systematic and uniform manner as well. And what that means to developers is that that makes it easier to encourage IT to uh, adopt different new technologies, right? So if, if they're screaming out for Node.js, some of the barriers to adoption 
can be mitigated somewhat. Okay, so now uh, that particular guy's running, and we'll see that. Um, It's done a build. We can inspect things such as events associated with the build. More importantly, so here's the pod that's been created at runtime for it. And here's the service, right? So it's now exposed an endpoint that you can then, is where you'll reach into that particular service. Again, that's all done automatically. So this is also quite a big step, right? So a fully deployable application that you can actually interact with on the internet or the internet, etc. The whole process is fully automated. You don't need to be talking to your network, networking people to get an IP address or an endpoint address. That's all done by the platform. So the whole endpoint addressing is done automatically. So that alone, you know, re removes so much friction out of the whole deployment process because it's fully, fully automated. Um, so if we were to see that actually running, it's a pretty trivial app, but there it is, right? So there's the new endpoint that's been exposed that will reach in and, and interact with that particular application, right? Now scale that up by tens and hundreds of thousands is how we start to talk about the kind of scale, the kind of scale that matters. So if I want to um, uh, scale this up, there's a number of different ways I can do, do it, but ultimately, sort of one way is to issue a, an API. So I can tell it to take that particular application, So, forget the. Okay, so here is an example of sending a scaling request to that application we built before called Node.jsxs, and I basically said create another replica. So that could be replicas equals n. Right. So, again, in the real world, what would happen would be customers would typically have a significant business transaction monitoring system, management system, right, that is managing the customer experience. So based on certain performance criteria, you may, you may make a decision to say, okay, if, res if response times drop by a uh, increase to a certain amount, then scale up, right? So if we go back to the web console now, we should see, um, we've got now got two of these little guys. Right? Okay, so that could be N, right? And as well, the proxying into expanding requests across those instances is also automated via by, by, by the route. So um, at 727, how do you want to? Oh, keep going. What do you think? Yeah. That's sort of a bit of a, a bit of a flavor. Now, just a little, is another kind of example. Um, so I mentioned for it's a fully native. Docker implementation. That means anything you can do in Docker, you can run on here. Just to give you an example of that, um, who's familiar with um, R? R? Anyone? Familiar with R Studio? Okay. So um, I build a Docker, I write up a Docker file that will build up a Docker image that will run R Studio, right? And I'm running it on OpenShift. So. Um, there it is, our studio. It's running there. Uh, where is it? Okay, so that's it now. The our studio product running on a base CentOS image with all the sort of R implementation stuff, exposing a nice little endpoint. So people that know R will know how much work it is to actually build this stuff and get all the packages right. So, for example, if you look at the um, The Docker file. So the Docker file to build that guy, you know, goes on and on and on and on and on right? because of all the packages that I wanted to actually test with. But so the beauty about the Docker model and the container model, of course, is you do that once now, publish it as an image, and anybody can use it, right? And so, so one of the use cases here, for example, is in, in higher education where they say training people on R, right? Or even in, in the enterprise because now they don't need to write. 20 page installation guides, all they do is build the image and publish it. So for example, there's my image on our, of our studio that I built on the public Docker Hub. So I pulled that down onto OpenShift to run. And that's, so that's also an example of, of obviously making public 
images accessible to run on OpenShift as well. So there it is, and so people have been pulling it down. There's another one. So there's all sorts of ones like that. So, so I've got another um, Docker image here, for example, Weight Watcher, which is actually a business rules engine, which takes in you know, weight observations, and then reasons over those weight observations as a time series to apply rules to then derive insights such as average weight, maximum weight loss, maximum weight gain, all that kind of stuff, right? That's what Business Rule Engine does, which happens to be a, a um, Red Hat thing. But I'll make, so here we go, we've got a, um, I can take this Docker file. This is a Plus Studio con, uh, running container, reading a, um, a R Studio, uh, and it's an R script, and what this R script will do is then basically uh, send a payload of weight observations to that running container. So that's now R Studio as a container running on OpenShift in my Vagrant image. Um, and with a bit of luck, it will um, send a payload of simulated weight observations to that uh, other Docker container on OpenShift on the internet somewhere and give you an error. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, clearly it's a real demo, because otherwise that would have just worked, right? So, do you, so if it fails, what should you do? <coughs> Repeat exactly the same thing and get a different result, which we have. So as you can see, right, there's a, there's a response from the, um, that little uh, uh, rules, rules engine. Cause so what that rules engine does, right, is return some aggregate, you know, aggregate, aggregate data points around those series of weight observations. That's a whole different story which we can talk about. But anyway, it works. Now, all this sort of stuff and these examples are on, some of them I publish, so um, that link before will get you over there. So for example, um, on my blog, you'll find a, a very detailed example of say, you know, how to take a Docker application, package it up for OpenShift, run it, very, very detailed. Um, so if you want to play with that, you can. But ultimately, for example, you know, I'm, I'm describing the Hadicrad project, so that that project deploys to a certain node. Um, pull, pull in the other Docker images. And then um, creating an application based on that Docker image. So to create an app, so you may recall one of the ways you can create an application in OpenShift is a native Docker image, right? So how would you do that? Literally, you would do this OC, so that's the CLI tool. New app, point to source of Docker image. That's it. That's what we need to do. Plus, expose the service um, so that it's got a particular uh, address to the routing endpoint. That's it. So those two commands will basically uh, take a JBoss rules engine, package it up, close the container, expose an endpoint for it. Questions? Yeah, let's open up. Has anyone got any questions? The routing layer is a TCP or an HTTP? HTTP. HTTP. Okay. Yeah, but I TCP think. Routing and all? Pardon? Can you just do TCP? Can you do lower level routing? Uh, I would say probably by because it's all pluggable. So I haven't I haven't encountered that particular permutation yet. Not to say it can't be done. Using yeah. Yeah. So all the components are actually, um, the way they're implemented is pluggable, so that, for example, you know, one example of a pluggability would be, okay, customer doesn't want to use HA uh, proxy, they want to use F5, mm -hmm. you can then plug in, um, okay. yeah, that. You can then plug in F5. It's, yeah, it's all open source, it's all pluggable. Um, and, and so some customers, for example, we provide a, a, plug, plug, a, 
plug for F5, for example, at the moment, and NGINX is, as well. Yeah, in terms of persistent storage, what kind of file system do you Yeah, uh, NFS and more to come. More? And there's a, whole, there's a whole list that we're currently uh, Luster. coming. Yeah, each, that one we may have now, but it's certainly on the roadmap very, very soon. And NFS border, NFS border. I don't know, I don't know what specifics around NFS it is. Though. But there is a whole range I know that they bring on board. It's Cluster, Seth, NFS, but I don't know exactly which variant. So the idea here, of course, is that um, you expose, the system will expose a vo an external volume mount. The pod can claim it as part of the quality of service and will guarantee that there's no conflicts around the claim, which is a non-trivial thing to do. <laughs> So multiply this by a thousand is what you know systems start to look like. Yeah. And, and in terms of storage support, does it support like you know uh, storage from different providers? Or it yeah, so there'll be two parts of that. So there'll be ones that so the architecture is pluggable, and then there'll be storage implementations that we will sh ship and support. And clearly, some of the Red Hat favorite mechanisms will be there, like Luster and Ceph and the products that we have. And I'm sure you probably plug in others. But that wouldn't probably be, they may not necessarily be supported by us, right? So that's at your own risk. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this might be a simple basic question, but I'm just wondering how does Docker differ from like traditional package managers or package management, so your RPM? Well, um, so one of the things about the, um, so we're getting into a bit. That was a three beer. That was a three beer question. <laughs> uh, so some of the attributes around this container model is that remember it's um, all dependencies are fully uh, resolved within the container. Okay, so you can then multi-tenant many many containers shared by the same host operating system, and there's sort of no conflict or collisions in terms of dependency on services at the host layer, except for of course a Docker runtime, uh, the Docker runtime layer. Um, it's immutable. Um, I think that's a fundamental difference from some of the other models, isn't it? It provides a deployable, runnable unit, remember. So literally, the Docker image, that RStudio example, right? That RStudio thing is a Docker image published on hub.docker.com. You pull that down and it runs as a container. So it's probably solving slightly different, different problems. So but for example, RPM, when I built the Docker file, it's probably where that would come in, right? So maybe you want to... Um, What's the difference? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so just to confuse you, so OpenShift Online, which is where, what you would find on the web, right? That's based on version 2 today. Version 2 uses a different container model, which we call cartridges. Okay. So the, the cartridge model... So OpenShift version 2 has its origins for like four or five years ago, before really there was any agreement in the industry around, say, the notion of a convergence around container specifications like, like Docker. So we build our own, okay? So we build a very lightweight cont container model, which we call a cartridge. Um, ultimately, from the developer experience and the problems it's solving, it's, it's very similar. But the, deep, the technical implementation is different, but where there's probably the biggest difference, probably the biggest, one of the big benefits around the Docker container model, is because we've agreed to a Docker specification, then that then opens it up to the vast world of technologies that you can source from, from, from that are Docker compliant, which are millions, right? And um, so that's sort of one difference. Um, the, um, the orchestration technology is different. Uh, they're solving the same problem, right? Creating, destroying, scaling up, scaling back instances of containers, same thing. But, it's in, but we build our own called an OpenShift Broker. But now we've, con we've converged with that Kubernetes model as well. Um, so the container, the container specification is, is a big difference. Let's say you build stuff on version 2 and you want to use version 3. Migration is actually pretty straightforward because at the end of the day, what problem are we doing? We we're automating the whole build process, right? So you just push the button, build again, and point to a different uh, uh, version 3. And of course, with the source to image model, all you'd really do would be point to Git repo, <laughs> pick the Docker image, and bang, and create it. 
obviously you're, you're aiming this a lot towards the enterprises, the larger enterprises um, that want to manage these complex environments. Um, is the, when you talk about the master and then the pod relationship, could they be across a DR site, so multiple sites to sort of solve that problem that's often hard for businesses? Yeah, so, so first of all, in terms of, um, so it's, the, the, the platform is certainly about solving the problem of you know, managing at scale complex, complex distributed applications. Would a small enterprise necessarily want to build that for themselves? Absolutely not, right? But what they may do is go to a service provider and say, provide me a PaaS as a service, right? So that's actually a common model. So large enterprises, like a large bank, telco, etc., may well want to have a scale that they want to build and operate their own entire system. Smaller enterprises will probably go to the market and say, and there are suppliers out there that will then build and operate and build and operate for you. Okay. Next part, question, which is about uh, large scale multi centered data center distributed environments. Absolutely, Amadeus, right. for example. So it's a fundamental requirement for them. And of course, the, um, the Docker portability model encourages that too, because now at least you know, you've got a guaranteed deployable unit that will run anywhere as long as you've got you know, an agreement on the host Docker runtime. And the separation of routing layer and container instance also makes that easier right, to then fan it across different data centers based on some kind of criteria. Probably got time just for one more. <coughs> in V2, you had the, um, the scope of years in the broker for process and compute scaling. Does that, does that fall through to V3? Yeah, pretty much all the concepts that, if you're familiar with V2, <coughs> do map to V3. Yep. With some different terminologies that confuse you, but yep. the art, but you can absolutely V three, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, satisfies the notion around project resources and quotas. Yep. So that that you create sense. projects, you assign resources and quotas to them. The system will then honour it. Yeah. Same idea. Well, thank you very much for that.